Welcome to episode 113 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to discussing the work of writer director J.J. Abrams, as well as his greater Bad Robot Universe. I'm your host, as usual. My name is Marcelo Inestroza, joined as always by my fellow co-host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition of the show, we'll be discussing Fringe, season four, episode one, entitled Neither Here Nor There. So, Matt, with that being said, I have a question for you. Do you glimmer? I don't glimmer because I never existed. I was wiped from the existence after my thoughts on the season three finale of Fringe went went bad. So here we are. We waited months and months in real time back in the day in 2011 to see what has happened to the Fringe team after Peter bridged the two sides of the universe together. And in this episode, we find out what happened is he has turned the opening credit sequence amber. That is the main difference that happens at the beginning. We get a different tinge for the the main credit sequence, but we are firmly planted for the most part in our main universe where people no longer remember Peter we do open with a scene with Olivia and faux Olivia having their talk about how their sides are bridged and they're going to begrudgingly have to work together. So Anna Torv is still pulling double duty. We don't get really any alternate of any note in this. But Marcella, what are you thinking as we open and we're back to this? Nobody remembers Peter and we're catching up with what their life is now that Peter Bishop was never here. I really like this episode because it really focuses on our version of Lincoln Lee. And it's almost like a fringe soft reboot. So if the so if the fringe team wanted to wrap up the wrap up the quote unquote uh the, the quote unquote mission statement of the entire series uh after the first three seasons and they wanted to do a reboot, which would be insane and stupid. But if they wanted to, this episode could have served as a soft reboot because you mentioned we do get those l- light hints there's that there's something wrong with the universe. But other than that, this almost could have served as an entirely new show. And the things that I liked about it was Lincoln Lee, our Lincoln Lee, ends up investigating a case. And in the process of investigating that case... His partner gets murdered and his partner gets murdered by this guy who touches his skin and makes his skin translucent. Why is that important? Because translucent skin is something that we've seen before in the fringe universe. And it's a callback to the pilot. So I like how this episode played with moments that we've seen before, but in a different fashion. And lastly, the reason why I like this episode so much is because after all the fighting and all the timey wimey, you know, bullshit that you weren't happy with last night, uh, that you weren't happy with last week, and that you know you sort of sort of brought me along into understanding that no, this that finale was ridiculous and stupid. Um, this was a like a welcome back into the fringe universe, and I I liked it quite a bit. Yeah, it's not bad. And as you said, hearkening back to the pilot with the translucent skin is something that's kind of cool and very fringe mystery of the week ish, but then is going to, as we dig deeper, link back to stuff that we're more familiar with from later seasons of Fringe. So I did like that that weird translucent skin thing worked its way into this translucent. Of course, now I always immediately think of the boys and the superhero, but uh, here we immediately think of people on that first flight from the pilot episode of Fringe. So I liked that. We do catch up with Lincoln Lee, this version of Lincoln Lee, who we did meet last season, but because Peter Bishop no longer ever existed, he doesn't remember that he has met Olivia Dunham. And so they're trying to get us reinvested in this whole scenario without Peter, which is a tough ask. Now, we don't abandon Peter altogether. There's a couple of flashes of him early on 
to let us know that something messed up is happening. So there's a scene where, like, you know, Walter starts to walk in just behind him for a second. There's a little flash of Peter. And it's like a Tyler Durden fight club flash kind of bullshit, which which is fine. And I like that they're like, okay, we build up to more flashes of Peter near the end to remind us that don't worry, Joshua Jackson is still going to be on this show in some capacity. You know, Seth Gable hasn't taken over for him, which I appreciate it. We do see the scene where September and December have a conversation and we find out that, you know, Peter never existed, but something is wrong. There seem to be echoes happening. September is told, like, you have to fix this. You have to fix it. You've got to do whatever you got to do to 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 correct your mistake because you're the one who started all of this shit by saving Peter and Walter on that day on the frozen lake. So this is on you, pal. Take this machine and go do what you got to do. And as the episode unfolds, we basically find out that what he has to do is take this machine and use it to erase any of the remnants of Peter Bishop that are kind of lingering in Walter's mind. And as the episode goes on, there's a few moments where Walter sees like a reflection and the episode ends with the big moment being him seeing a reflection of Peter in a TV and freaking out, freaking out because he doesn't know what this means, but it's something that's haunting him. What are you thinking as September deactivates this machine and doesn't do what he's supposed to do? And Walter sees the reflection of Peter in the TV that causes such a huge reaction from him. I really like that because that really that really drives home the point to me that the observers are aliens from another universe, but they do have the capability to they do have the capability to feel. We had that one episode earlier on in our fringe review about that one observer that loved the girl that he was observing so much that he made her important to the timeline that we were on at the time. And if I'm not mistaken, September was the one that he last spoke to. So in a way, that that episode has some linkage back to this episode. So I like that September is letting the timeline unfold the way it is now, regardless of whether our Peter is trying to bleed through and, you know, because essentially what the observers want September to do is to put a plug into, into the timeline and to prevent the, the remnants, the the remnants of Peter from breaking through, regardless of whether it's in Walter's mind or not. That's what, that's what it basically is. It's a plug. Remember how the Island was like a plug. in Lost? Yeah. 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 I was like, I had no idea where I was going, but, just a second before you said that, I was like, a plug. Hmm. Where, where have I heard that before? No, but, but you know, essentially, I really like that we are shown that uh, September has feelings for Walter and he is able to sympathize with him. And ultimately, I think he's curious. Now, I'm really interested to see how the dynamic between Olivia and Walter work in this universe because in this universe being that Walter and Olivia don't remember Peter, I'm really interested to see how Olivia, you know, you, you know started working at the fringe division. I mean, she does mention the, the, the plane incident to Lincoln at a point, but I'm really interested to see how, um, how the writers are going to play with those dynamics like, I, I don't know how long Peter's going to be gone for. So if he's going to be gone for like two or three episodes, which he's not. But if he is, I'm interested to see how they're going to play with those dynamics of showing us the world we know, but different in a way. I don't think I'm going to get any of that, but I'm just saying. Right. And we do see some of how the world is different in this episode, because when it opens as it plays, we find out that. Walter has been out of the asylum for seven that he was in for 17 years because Olivia got him out to work on these cases. Astrid is in the field more than just being the office assistant. She's on the scene early on 
when Walter tells her over the earpiece, I need to check the anus, check the anus, as he's munching on popcorn. And Astrid's like, um, yeah, I'm going to need to check the anus. And uh, so Astrid has a little bit of a different role now that Peter wasn't there. She's actually out and about, not just stuck in the lab waiting for everybody to come back and bring her the work. So we see a few of those minor differences in this episode. Now, I appreciate that we got more about what this Lincoln Lee is all about. We find out about his partner, Danzig. You know, he goes to meet him in the morning and this guy's always running late. Lincoln is ready to go on time. He's had breakfast. He kisses the kid, guy's kids goodbye. I like other universe Lincoln Lee. I'm endeared to him. I think he kicks ass. This guy, who's a little bit nerdy, a little bit buttoned down, I do not care for. And I do not care about. I like the other universe, Lincoln Lee, and I in general like Seth Gable as a performer. But bringing this guy in, who doesn't remember anything about Fringe, I'm like, fuck, we're going to have to explain this shit again to him? What is it, the season premiere? Oh, wait. Yeah, so we explain that to him for anybody who's just jumping into the show, even though this is a boat you missed a long time ago. You should have already been on board. So we do get those things where... We want to bring in new viewers. We're going to re-explain what Fringe Division is. We're going to have a mystery of the week. I don't like it as much as the Peter dynamic at all. And I'm fine with it for one or two episodes. But like, if this was going to be the new norm, not for me. I, a hard pass. Because uh, Seth Gable is not as charismatic and as fun to watch as Joshua Jackson is in this, like, you know, the straight man, the audience conduit being walked through this universe. So I. I appreciate it a bit, but overall, I don't like this dynamic for the show as much as what it usually operates at. So, like, the less time that we are dealing with this version of Lincoln being the newbie on the fringe team, the better, because I am not here for it. Would you have liked it if this version of Lincoln Lee stayed and he became a permanent member of the team and Peter came back eventually? Even what I would have liked more is if we had just started and this version of Lincoln Lee was already on Team Fringe and part of the group and was a was basically the Peter surrogate if Peter didn't exist and was a little bit more confident and we didn't have to hold his hand as we're dealing with all this stuff. I would have actually been completely fine with that if he felt a little bit more just with it and rather than like we have to, like I said, hold his hand through all of this stuff. But I do appreciate that as this is going on, we find out these translucent people are increasing in numbers. And this is something that in the last while is exponentially ramping up. And they realize that these are now what we formerly knew, basically, as the shapeshifters. This is like Shapeshifter 2.0 death has gotten an upgrade or whatever the hell we want to say, some cheesy bullshit. But we see a lot of them, the, the weird translucent woman lurking, watching over them as they're investigating. And so we realize that even though the universes are now equalized, there's still some stuff going on here where this is the technology that was used as part of Walternet's shape-shifting army. So what is the overarching thing going on here? And I do like when Olivia and Folivia have another meeting. The other side is like, yeah, we'll look into it because we're saying this is this is some weird you guys crap. So like, what's what's happening here? If it's not you, who is it and what's going on? So I do like that overall thread. So the thread of the two universes begrudgingly having to work together to figure out what this threat is is and is going to be i like that i just i really wish lincoln had his memory or had some sort of experience with us and we just caught up with him being a part of the team rather than every day joe off the street is freaked out because he's seeing some fringe events for the first time did it bother you that because essentially the other side and our side have like a bridge it's like a giant elevator it's like entering a ride at galaxy's edge and having the most inappropriate, you know, park manager person asking your blood type, your your mental history, your weight, 
did you like uh did you like that stuff and i was really pissed off that after all of the cortex fan stuff with olivia after everything that she went through to be able to go to the other side in the earlier seasons now all that she has to do is step into an elevator and i'm like really guys that is a bridge now i understand that this show at the time was on a budget and it's on fox for god's sakes I understand that, but I'm like, they, they built up so much awesome mythology with Olivia's ability to go to the other side, and now she can just like go on an elevator and be there within seconds. Yeah, it's definitely something that's just more convenient if this is going to be something that happens all the time, so we don't have to have this big emotional expenditure of Olivia traversing the universes. We can literally just have her take an elevator and go to a, the the bridge and meet up. So I appreciate the cleanness of like, because of what Peter did, this is now an easy process. There is like a meeting spot where they can meet up and it's neutral ground. It's the Switzerland of this situation. And we can just hash it out and then go back to our respective sides, which is great if we're going to keep the other side actively involved in the plot. And I think that that, that works, but it is it is one of those new resets that we have to just get used to because going from universe to universe wasn't something that was easy before, and now it's just floor three and we're we're all good. So I think that's part of the new dynamic, and you know I did enjoy this as an entertaining hour of television. I just think knowing that the show was doing kind of a soft reboot while still bringing the baggage of everything that happened, but every beginning of a new season, they want it to be a jumping off point that if this is your first episode, you can kind of come in slowly and enjoy the show. I just hope that this isn't a dynamic that we live in for a long time because it's, it's not the one that I prefer when Fringe is operating on all cylinders. Usually I get more of a high from the fun and dynamic of the character's that I know and love. We get a little bit of the fun Walter stuff, but other than that, and Folivia being really sassy still, there's not much else that I I like character-wise. Everybody's just kind of going through the motions and and acting a little bit out of sorts just from us as an observer of this, how they are now, because Peter was never there. By your own admission, you are very, very critical about the the way that the finale was structured, right? The Fringe season three finale. So it's very odd to me that, because if if I'm reading you right, you were expecting uh, a lot more from the first episode of season four, right? Yeah, uh, at least a little bit more setup of where we are heading and what the stakes are. The scene that I like very much is when um, Lincoln and Olivia are in the elevator going to the other side and Olivia says all throughout the course of my life, I felt a hole in my heart. There was something missing in my heart. And when the, when the flight happened from the pilot, I found friends division. I found Walter and I knew that this was a place where I was going to feel whole again and I was going to get some answers. So I really, really like that because because that says to me that although in this sort of remix of the Fringe universe, being that Peter doesn't exist to this point, there are some lingering emotions in Olivia's soul, but she doesn't know she doesn't quite know where they come from. In a way, I'm really interested to see what you have to say, what you have to say about this. In a way, it's a very Desmond kind of thing to do. Just, just very, very lightly, like, like I, I don't, I don't know if I'm reading too much into that, or what do you think about that? I do think it was intentionally there to sort of say that even though this is the new normal, somehow a few people have a sense that this isn't how it always was, and that maybe there is something lingering and hanging on, which actually manifests in Walter's visions of Peter. But I do think that that is kind of what they were hinting at with Olivia. And I like that 
But again, just the way that the show is operating now is not my favorite mode for Fringe. So I'm hoping we can get back to the the dynamic that I prefer. But if we don't, then I'm interested to see where they're taking it and why the dynamic change was important to them. The thing that I wanted to bring up to you is that you mentioned in the finale that you love the fact that the Fringe writers reached a point in their storytelling where they said, fuck it. If you're not on board, get the fuck off. So with that being said, why in the world do you think they wrote this episode the way that they did? Why do you think at this point in the series, they could have possibly still have been concerned with bringing new people on? I don't understand that. Yeah, I think that's just a network note. <laughs> so I think that it's like they barely got renewed for a fourth season and Fox was like, hey, you need to make this a little bit more accessible. We let you do your thing last year. Try and invite new people in. And so every season premiere, they kind of do that where they they let people join the show if you have missed it. At this point, DVDs were a thing where people were buying DVDs and Blu-rays to catch up in between seasons. But we still aren't at the streaming spot where it's super easy, where a show now, if you have never seen Stranger Things, you can't watch season four of Stranger Things. But they also don't expect that because all four seasons are available to you at all times that if you want to get on board with it, you start at season one. So they never have to do an episode that brings in new viewers because all of it is in one place for you to watch. But that still wasn't the case in 2011. So I feel like Fox said, hey, we renewed you guys. You're back, but you guys need to do us a solid so that we can consider keeping you on the air for your entire run and give you another season. And that's this. And they do it in a way that it doesn't feel like the writers are begrudgingly doing it. They did it in a way that, oh, we can bring Lincoln over and have him be the guy who acclimatizes new people to this episode. I really like this sort of tiny comedic moment when our Lincoln steps into the lab and Walter is trying to bring a bird back to life. And Lincoln sort of just walks up. He sort of just casually holds the bird. And then Walter injects him with something and just the bird flies off. And Lincoln's like, uh, did you bring that bird to back to life? And Walter goes, no, he's quite dead. And then Lincoln goes... Who are you people? So I I just I just really liked the the sort of fish out of water take to Lincoln in this episode. I I really really liked that. And I also liked his sense of awe and wonder once he went to the other side with our Olivia because he really didn't say anything. He he interacted with two versions of Olivia Dunham and he said nothing. Right. All he did was just look with a magnificent sense of wonder. So that really played really, really well to me. So yeah, I think I you know, I think for the most part, I I really like this episode way more than you did, but your reasons are justified too. If they're still doing this shit in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna be complaining too. This episode was written by the heavy hitters, being uh J.H. Wyman, uh Pinkner and uh Akiba Goldsman. Now Last season, Akiva Goldsman was a consulting producer, right? And this season, he still has the same credit. So I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? Like, is he a part of the team? Or 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 or, or did the editor not just like or like did nobody bother to switch his credits up? I don't understand because it's like a a consulting producer uh doesn't do no or a or consult or a consultant. He's credited as a as a, as a consultant. A consultant on a TV show doesn't do as much work as Akiba has done. It's tough because TV credits are weird. They're not the same as movie credits. Like there are eight different titles for people who are are in the writer's room and they're all called something different. So I feel like because Akiva was one of the main guys who helped craft this multi-universal story back in season two when they started going down this road no matter what happens he's always going to be getting some sort of credit and i'm sure that they're consulting with him on the overarching story to to bounce ideas off whether that shows up as a consultant or an associate producer or what have you is like a lot of backroom stuff that 
contracts that we just don't understand. So as long as his name is on this show, I believe that he is still actively involved, unlike someone like J.J. Abrams, who has been hands-off on the show for a long time, but his name still appears every week because he was one of the main guys when it started. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, you know, it's a it's a bad robot, right? I mean, I... I have a I, I have a really, really big problem with creative people getting credit for the work that for 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 something that they didn't do. That being said, if your production company, you know, birth something into existence, I have no problem with your name being on there, even if you know, you know, even if you weren't physically involved with the show since its conception in season two, because I think the last episode that JJ wrote was the season two premiere with Alex and Bob. What are you looking forward to with the season to come? What what are some of your hallmarks that you're really looking forward to? I'm basically just waiting until Josh Jackson gets back into the fold in a proper way to justify the absolutely insane decision to erase him from existence at the end of the third season. Because as much as this is an ensemble show, the ensemble doesn't work if we remove one of the top three guys from the equation. There are lots of shows that do soft reboots or do cast swaps, and that's fine, but that is not the show that I fell in love with. So I'm just waiting for us to find a way to justify the end of season three and go forward in a way that doesn't make me resent the fact that they wanted a jaw-dropping cliffhanger and wrote themselves into a corner that... I'm not sure they know the way out of. Yeah, for me, uh, much like you, I just want a cohesive story that makes sense from a writer's perspective. If you're going to play with time travel, play with it well. Because last season, what they did, what they did with the last episode, after sitting down with you, really made no fucking sense. So if they're gonna, so if they're gonna continue to play with time the way that they've been playing with it. Play with it in interesting and exciting ways. I'm worried that they're going to try to write themselves out of this corner, and then they're going to write themselves into another corner. And then ultimately, what they come up with isn't going to be satisfying to either to, 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 to either of us. So that's what I'm afraid of. I think that at this point in the show, you know, as much as I gave Jay Twyman credit, there's no way that he could physically get out of this writing hole you know, and, and tell a cohesive story that is interesting and makes sense from a writer's pers- perspective. I have done a complete 180 on J.H. Wyman, and uh, you, you, you didn't even have to help me. You know, as much as I complain, I think that most of my complaints stem from my personal expectations versus what we got. So I would say in terms of this episode meeting my expectations, it's like a 6 out of 10. But in terms of enjoying what they gave us, it's like a 7.5 out of 10. Marcella, what would you rate this premiere out of 10 in terms of those two criteria? Yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. I would actually give it an 8. I would actually, I would actually give it an 8. It, it, it really made me feel like I was back in that fringe bad robot universe. And it, it just felt simple and sweet compared to the gobbledygook that we got last week for us. Uh, So, with that being said, guys, I think that'll do it for this edition of Radio 815. Listen, if you guys like the show and you guys like anything that we do here and you want to reach out to us, there are a couple ways to do that. First, you can just reach you can just reach out to us on Twitter by using the hashtag Radio 815. You can reach out to us on our personal Twitter account. It's JJ Universe 815 or. Uh, If you don't like using a standard, you know, using a traditional podcast feed, we do have a YouTube channel. It's it's YouTube.com slash Radio 015. All our back episodes are listed on there. If you want to talk to me personally, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88. But Matt, if the good folks want to reach out and talk to you about anything, what would be the best place for them to do that? On Twitter at Matt Crandall. All right, guys. So that'll do it. And uh, until next week, as I say often, we'll talk back soon. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.